Uh, well, thank you, Ethan. Uh, can everybody hear me? So um, thank you and uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Mike Pichak. I'm the commissioner at the Department of Financial Regulation and uh, have been assisting uh, with coordinating the state's COVID-19 disease spread modeling. Um, before we get into the presentation that Ethan is pulling up, I do wanna emphasize right off the top um, that the situation that we are all dealing with is obviously a very fluid one. Um, and the projections that we have run, uh, the, project the projections that we were reviewing a week ago, uh, or even just a few days ago, uh, are looking uh, very differently uh, than they do today. So I just want to underscore that the situation, uh, as you can imagine, evolves quickly uh, and changes uh, quite uh, rapidly. So getting into the overview of the modeling, um, really here at the state, when we set out to uh, try to get an estimate and a forecast of what the hospital resources might be uh, for the state of Vermont, we really wanted to develop multiple uh, forecasting perspectives. We wanted to get the viewpoint of a number of professionals in the field. Uh, we have uh, established relationships with uh, Oliver Wyman, an international consulting firm, uh, Columbia University and Northeastern University. So at each one of these institutions, we've been working with uh, individuals that are expert in infectious disease, uh, and infectious disease modeling. Uh, so it's been very useful to have them collaborate with us uh, on this information. Uh, but even with the best uh, minds uh, available to us, it's important again to remember that forecasting is imprecise in nature. And again, particularly with the types of dynamics that are at play with the COVID-19 situation. Some ways that we try to make it more predictable and less imprecise is to focus on the shorter term or the near term. When we forecast out multiple months or uh, half a year, those projections become considerably less predictable uh, and things that are considerably less precise. We also want to focus on range rather than a specific number. So in our forecast, we talk about likely, best, and worst. Uh, we do aff affix specifics to those, but we should be thinking about them as ranges and trajectories rather than definitive uh, specific numbers or outcomes. It's also important for us to consistently refine the modeling and we're refining it both by incorporating new data and by learning new assumptions. These experts that we're working with as well as uh, our own teams here in the state uh, are continually getting better information about what to expect uh, coming out of uh, other states or cities in the United States, but certainly the experience of other countries across the globe as well. And then ultimately, I do want to have everyone keep in mind uh, that it's important for us uh, to realize uh, that we have to have the appropriate perspective with all this uh, modeling. Uh, we are certainly using it for planning purposes, uh, but it is not representative of definitive outcomes. We control the outcome uh, by the measures that we implement and how closely we follow them, uh, much more so than a forecast does. And then ultimately, we are using these forecasts to um, determine important hospital resource needs, things like the number of staffed hospital beds we will need, uh, how many ICU beds we will need, the available ventilators, uh, and the supply of PPE. Ultimately, that's what we're planning toward, and that's the value that we find uh, in the forecasting. So Ethan, if we can go to the next slide, I will apologize up front for all of the information that's on this slide. Uh, there's a lot going on, but it does tell an important story and an important narrative uh, that I just want to spend a second or two on. Basically, this chart will track the disease spread as a percentage of a country's population over time. And when you look at the experiences of whatever country you select, you see the United States there on the right, uh, the countries experience a similar pattern. There is a period of, uh, of accelerated growth, of rapid growth, uh, followed by a gradual slowdown of the disease uh, brought on by uh, social distancing measures, expanded testing, uh, a combination of the both, or uh, a percentage of the, of the population uh, having gotten the disease and then uh, not being able to get the disease again. So any of those factors certainly are playing uh, a hand there, but those are important 
uh, things for us uh, to take a look at and to consider. More specific and more important to us is the Northeast uh, specific data. So you'll see here a similar chart, much less confusing, a lot less going on, um, but it tells an important story for us in the Northeast. This was the uh, Northeastern states as of March 26th. You can see our growth rates as again, as a percentage of our populations. Vermont was growing relatively consistent. And we were growing alongside Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts. New York and New Jersey were ahead of us. Uh, Rhode Island and New Hampshire were off to the right, meaning they had a similar amount of cases, but their populations are considerably larger than us. And at this point in time, Vermont was experiencing a 32% five-day daily growth rate. So our growth rate was putting us in the top 15 in the country in terms of our 15-day rolling average of growth rate. If we fast forward just five or six days here uh, to March or to April 1st, you'll see that Vermont is on a very different trajectory. Uh, you see that we've moved to the right of Massachusetts. Uh, we've moved further away from Connecticut. We've moved to the right also of Pennsylvania and moving closer to Rhode Island and New Hampshire. Um, and our five-day rolling average is now 12%, so a considerable uh, decrease from March 26. So this really underscores how volatile and rapid uh, of a change you can see in a very short period of time. To drill it back down on Vermont specific data and to explain a little bit about why we're seeing a change in that disease growth trajectory, you'll see here the Vermont daily count of confirmed cases uh, and the cases that were existing from the day prior as well. And for a period of time, we were growing uh, at a case of, of a double casing of about three days. So every three days, we would see our case count double. Uh, and that was true uh, for about a period of nine to 10 days. But for the last five and a half days or so, um, it took us uh, that period of time for our caseload to double. So we went from about 158 cases on March 26th to about uh, just over 300 cases uh, between March 31st and April 1st. So we had a slowdown in our growth rate from a three-day doubling to a five-and-a-half-day doubling, uh, which is uh, good news in terms of the disease spread, obviously, here in the state. Another way to visualize this uh, is with this chart. We see, again, the confirmed cases going up to just over 300 as of today. Uh, and then we see the daily growth rate depicted by that yellow line uh, throughout the slide. So earlier on, when we had less data and it was less credible, the line was uh, much more volatile. As we get closer to having 100 cases, that line A stabilizes. And then what we've seen over the last five or six days is the daily growth rate slowly decline and go down. Again, that is good news in terms of um, the disease growth here in Vermont. And this, I should mention, is happening even though we are seeing uh, some larger numbers of cases reported that when compared to our aggregate numbers of already confirmed cases, it still leads to a decline in our growth rate. Now I wanna get into some of the forecasting that we have done and, and some of our projections. Uh, you'll see here that we have um, overlaid, uh, the blue line is our actual COVID-19 uh, growth rate. Um, the other lines, the red line at the top, uh, was a worst case scenario that we ran from an Oliver Wyman model. Uh, the light blue line was a Columbia model that we ran late March. The other blue line was a best case scenario uh, out of uh, Oliver Wyman in late March. And then those uh, sort of gold and pink lines are from a uh, best and worst case scenario that we ran in about mid-March. So you can see for a period of time, we were tracking quite closely with some of these scenarios. Um, all of the scenarios were within a pretty tight band there. But as we get closer to March 29th, it becomes quite clear that our actual case count in Vermont is deviating from that trajectory, from those more likely and worst case trajectories that were run. And we're moving toward a better case or best case scenario um, that uh, was run uh, early uh, in mid-March. Now, I will emphasize, again, we will always look at the data as it's coming in on a daily basis. These um, uh, data points can change quite rapidly. 
um, and we need more data to confirm the exact trajectory that we're on. But it is indicating to us initially uh, that uh, part of this is due to the sacrifices that Vermonters are making, that part of this is due to the sacrifices personally, professionally, socially that Vermonters are making by socially distancing themselves from their neighbors, from their friends, from their families, that you start to see some movement and some slowing of our disease growth uh, here in Vermont. To put a finer point on that, what I just uh, described, on average, it will take um, a social distancing measure about 10 to 14 days to be fully uh, effective. So what that means is there's a period of time where there's an onset period, there's a period of time where someone is having mild symptoms, then they seek uh, to go get a test. That test takes a period of time to come back and confirm uh, whether they're COVID positive. So that whole process can play out in about a 10 to 14 day period. So when the governor enacted the state of emergency, when he closed bars and restaurants, when he closed schools, we really weren't gonna see that result in the testing until about 10 to 14 days later. When you overlay those decisions in mid-March to the departure that we've been experiencing uh, in the end of March and early April, they would, again, seem to tell the story that the social distancing measures that have been implemented uh, are proving somewhat effective, uh, and that should be a, a glimmer of hope for Vermonters that their sacrifices are um, working and that it tells us also uh, that they need to keep up uh, those sacrifices and, in fact, uh, double down on them because even though we're seeing some incremental progress, we do know that the worst is still ahead of us, that although the disease growth is slowing, we are still seeing many cases being added to our daily count, and those cases will still require uh, hospital resources. So certainly something for us to um, watch closely going forward and something for us to um, show that our efforts and our sacrifices are working, but we must remain vigilant and continue to do all of the good work that Vermonters across the state are doing, staying at home, staying safe, uh, protecting themselves, uh, their families, and their communities. A slide here shows um, that basically the COVID testing has been rather uh, consistent during the same period of time. Certainly testing availability would be another reason why you would deviate from a forecasting, basically if you were under testing. Uh, not to say that that is not a plausible uh, or possible rather outcome of the, of the uh, deviation in the forecast. Because our testing has been consistent during this period of time, um, it likely points again to the fact that Vermonters are complying um, with the social distancing measures. This next slide, again, there's a lot going on, and I'll explain it uh, in some detail, but this is from our partner at Northeastern University, um, who uh, provided to us information about the daily uh, migration habits of Vermonters in an aggregate and anonymized basis. So we see on the top uh, the, daily, the percentage of daily commutes in Vermont. So way to the left, you have a very low percentage because that's New Year's Day. When you go across, you're going across in time and you get to about early February. That's when we uh, in Vermont experienced a severe snowstorm. You see that daily commutes went down. You follow that all the way down to when the emergency declaration was ordered, when the stay at home uh, decision was made. And you can see a, quite a precipitous drop uh, in the number of commutes that are being made uh, in Vermont down to a 50% reduction. Similarly, in terms of how uh, much people might be moving around their location of their home, you know, to the store, to the gym, to a friend's house, basically what's the radius of their, of their typical daily uh, habits and movement. Again, we see a, a decrease that is a positive sign in terms of a reduction um, in people doing those daily chores and daily habits. So again, this is telling us that Vermonters are sacrificing, they are, collectively following the guidance from the public health officials from the governor. They're doing their part in um, staying home, making sure they're staying safe, and making sure that we can do everything possible to slow the rate of disease growth in Vermont. So I do wanna, before going to the next slide, just preface, preface the next three slides that we will see 
these were slides that were conducted uh, in, and from modeling done on March 25th. This is when our rate of growth was about 32 to 35 percent. Um, they also take into account not just the total number of cases or the, the total daily case growth, but what we're drilling down on is what does that mean for how many staff beds will we need? What does that mean for how many ICUs will we potentially need? And what does that mean for how many ventilators we will potentially need? And again, we're thinking of these outcomes um, in terms of worst case, likely, and best case scenarios. So on March 25th, we were on, again, a different trajectory. But at that time, had we followed a worst case scenario, that's depicted by the red line. Had we followed a more likely scenario, that's depicted by the green line. And had we followed a better case scenario, that would be depicted by the blue line there on the bottom. You can see uh, how many beds are available as of today uh, on the left-hand side. You can also see that we have 29 patients hospitalized with COVID-19 today across the state of Vermont. So this gives you an estimate of what uh, the, the, the need will be, what the hospital resource need will be, and what the demand will be from Vermonters uh, at a given interval. You'll see that we go out to May and then to June. Again, uh, we have much more confidence in the shorter term projections. Things can change quite considerably, uh, particularly early on in a pandemic or early on in a curve, because as you change that trajectory early on, it will have a bigger impact later um, in the period of, of pandemic, if you will. So if we go to the next slide, I'll show you a similar trajectory for ICU bed availability. You'll see there a worst case scenario. Again, this is not a, a track that we are on here in Vermont. Uh, you see the likely scenario that's depicted in the green, and then you see a best case scenario depicted there at the bottom. Again, we are on a trajectory even better than at this time was the likely uh, outcome, so that is good news. However, I think this slide drives home the point that we are doing everything we can to increase our hospital resources, but we really need people to continue to do their social distancing habits. We are seeing an impact early on. That impact can be magnified and improved, and we can see even greater reduction in the weeks ahead. So that is the message we wanna make sure people drive home, that there is a improvement, that that improvement, however, can change considerably if people change their habits. We're not out of the woods yet. The worst is ahead of us. We anticipate a peak sometime uh, in the middle to late uh, uh, April or early May time period. So we really need people to be vigilant and to carry through with the social distancing that has shown some early glimmers of hope. And then again, I will go to the ventilator need slide. This is again showing a worst case scenario, a likely scenario, more likely scenario, and then a, a better outcome scenario. So again, as you can see here, uh, we need to continue to work on uh, building out our capacity, which we certainly are, but we also need people to take seriously, again, the call for continued social distancing and social isol isolation during the next two to three weeks in particular, uh, but certainly until the data reflects it's safe uh, not to do so. So just to recap, we have seen very good compliance in Vermont with the recommendations from public health officials from the orders from the governor. Um, that uh, compliance is clearly making some impact. The degree of that impact will need more data to, to totally understand. But we are seeing a reduction in the case growth in Vermont. That lines up with the actions that Vermonters have taken. Um, and we need them to double down on those actions so we can continue to see a lower case growth and less strain on our hospitals while we work to increase the resources that are available to ensure all Vermonters get the care they need when they need it. So at that time, I will turn it over to um, Secretary Smith to continue with the medical surge planning. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I really appreciate, uh, appreciate the work that Commissioner Pichek has done. It's been critical in terms of looking at the uh, medical surge and getting ready for the medical surge. 
I want to start by saying that what I'm about to show you is inconsistent with some of the predictive uh, trend lines that Michael just displayed. Um, there are two reasons for this. First, when we began planning for, sur for the surge response, um, there weren't enough cases to have sort of a predictive model. And the ramping up of uh, mitigation strategies were, were just taking place at that time. Uh, so we started using what Michael had produced for us was the blended worst case scenario. Uh, and his team built for us using that model of experiences with other countries. And that was extremely helpful. You, I, I just, I, I want to heap a lot of praise on Commissioner Pichek because these models early on were critical in us sort of starting our planning phases as early as we did. Secondly, we took um, the worst case scenarios because when you're planning an unprecedented event like this, and this is, a, this is an unprecedented event, where there are sort of many unknowns and where modeling isn't perfect, it really makes sense to plan for the worst case scenario. And if you look at history in particular, uh, you will find that where there have been failures in major sort of events like this, the fact is they did not plan for the worst case scenario. So in order to prevent the worst case strategies, the mitigation efforts the governor has put in place, although painful, uh, they are critical. And I can't emphasize this enough. They are critical to help us protect overwhelming our healthcare system. And to some degree, um, although it's still early, we're optimistic with what some of that um, may help us do in the future in terms of um, not trending along those worst case scenarios. Although what Mike, um, what Mike displayed may provide some encouragement, I just wanna say this is a very serious event. And, and I can't emphasize this enough. Lives are at stake. People must continue to conform to the mitigation efforts to help prevent the healthcare system from being overwhelmed. So before I show you the first slide, I wanna reiterate once again, the following important points, especially when planning for such an unprecedented event. Uh, first, models are tools to help us plan. There are many different models out there and you saw some of the models. There's the Columbia model, there's all sorts of models out there and they measure different things based on different inputs. So we use them to think through what we should do to prepare. There's no magic number or specific target. We take those models and we try to prepare as much as we can uh, to the higher end of those models. What we know is that under any scenario, we need to plan for more capacity. And I think I, I broadcast that about a week ago in a press conference with the governor where I said we need at least to double some of our um, scenarios in terms of numbers. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And that's just what we're doing. The surge effort is all in support of adding capacity to our hospitals. Um, our hospitals are our first and front line of defense and doing it, we're gonna be adding capacity to those, that hospital capacity over the course of the next few weeks and to be ready uh, for the time fr frame that Michael had talked about or Commissioner Pichek had talked about. This is, I just want to reframe everybody um, because we tend to think of this as a hurricane or, or a natural disaster like an earthquake or something like that, uh, where you can set up triage sites for the for the injured. This planning is very, very different. This is a very complex, complex a, a medical emergency where some patients will need days of care, including in the ICU and when ventilators and some may not. Um, the hospitals are, like I said, are our front line of defense and the state is working hand in hand with our hospitals and our healthcare system to support them and add capacity. 
And then lastly, I'm just going to, uh, before I go to the slide, I'm going to show you the overview of the hospital capacity modeling we are using as we do this planning. It's important to remember that the top of the chart represents the worst case scenario and that right now we're not trending that way. Um, but again, there is a difference between planning and modeling and we have to plan um, according to what we think is going to be a worst case scenario. So Ethan, could you go to the next slide, please? What's incredibly important in this, in this slide is that we need to keep all of the work we are doing uh, to use uh, social distancing and, staying, and the stay home, stay safe model. We, we've got to do that because we've got to flatten that worst case scenario uh, curve. If we don't flatten that, uh, we will go through our, our healthcare capacity. We're not on, again, I wanna emphasize, at this point, we're not on that traje trajectory, but we have to plan for that trajectory. But it is important to note that we really have to stick. What the governor has put out there for various executive orders. Um, this is important and I can't emphasize this enough. But even though our current trajectory is it on the worst case path, uh, we are using, like I said, the worst case scenario to help us in our planning, to stretch our planned capacity to, uh, so that we will be ready in case there's any change in the modeling that we are seeing. Ethan, can you go to the slide two, please? So what does that mean? What's the sort of framework of what we're trying to do here? And the, what we're trying to do is look at it from, a, from multiple perspectives of what we have to do, from the hospital's perspective, from the state's perspective, from special populations, from isolation sites. Let me just explain what that means. This is a complex planning effort with multiple layers of planning involved. First, hospitals have to be asked have been asked to plan to surge well beyond their existing capacity. That means they need to look at ways to increase beds, particularly ICU beds, vents, PEE within their, uh, within their hospital service area. This hospital surge capacity planning and implementation is well underway. If the hospitals need more bed space, the state has stepped in to provide overflow sites and equipment. I'll talk about that in a minute. Next, the state will assist hospitals when capacity is reached. Working with hospitals, uh, we've established targeted alternative care sites to uh, address the projected state, uh, what we call state medical maximum surge. And next, <clears throat> We, it's just not hospitals we sort of have to plan on. We have to look at those special populations as well. For example, in the news lately, you've heard that we've converted Woodside and we've converted Woodside for uh, those um, patients, those hospitalized mental health patients that are COVID-19. So we are looking at the various stages of those special populations, as well as isolation sites. And if you look at what the isolation sites are for are such populations, the vulnerable populations, such as homeless or others with special needs, or even those who are COVID positive, recovering or exposed, but don't require hospitalization, and those that do not have a safe place to remain isolated. And you've heard in the news, for example, Goddard College, and there's others, other areas that we're working with to form uh, these isolation uh, sites. Like I said, it's multiple. We've concentrated on hospitals in the first part of this, but there are other populations that we really have to plan for as we move forward. Can you go to the next slide, please? So what are we what are we doing for the medical surge? I want to I want to emphasize the medical surge here. Um, the state is creating an efficient, connected approach across Vermont to assist local hospitals uh, to manage patient load. This will consist of 
a regionalized state support to assist hospitals with the surge and a centralized approach to address state medical max. If we, if we break through the medical max on that, we'll have a, a centralized uh, approach to that. We are implementing, and, and you can see on your slides where these various sites are going to be. Um, we're implementing a scalable approach. We will be building in needed increments along this way with this modular approach. Um, it draws only the resources we need to staff current needs. The modular approach protects against massive overbuild that strains the resources. So <clears throat> you're going to start seeing, um, if you already haven't seen, that we're going to be setting up a state supported alternative care site facility at the Expo Center at the fairgrounds in Essex with up to 400 beds and another um, site in Rutland with up to 150 beds. Um, these are, I, I want to explain what these are. These are tier three sites and that's defined by the CDC <coughs> that would provide hospital level care for patients who do not have COVID-19 to increase the capacity for hospitals to care for COVID-19 patients. Um, that's our current plan. Um, the reason for the locations it, it should be quite obvious. They draw from the largest labor pools, plus UVM MC, UVM, the Vermont National Guard bases are right near. With Rutland, it simplified logistics, medevac airport, uh, route four and seven and lodging, um, those sort of things went into consideration. And then of course you'll see the hospital sort of surge sites um, in the Barry St. Albans and Patrick Jim. I do want to talk about Patrick Jim because that may include um, COVID-19 patients in that particular surge site. Those three surge sites, for example, will be staffed by the um, by the medical leads in those areas, CVMC uh, and uh, Northwestern Medical uh, and UVMMC. And then we have pre-staged some surge trailers in the area of uh, Brattleboro and Windsor at uh, Brattleboro Memorial and Mount Escutney. And as you can see, the state has two portable hospital units that will be deployed as needed, that will be strategically moved as needed as we move forward. Again, um, the, the special populations and isolation um, uh, populations we're working on and have set up sites like Woodside, sites like uh, we're in the process of Goddard. Um, we have moved uh, some of the psychiatric uh, patients uh, from the Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence to the Vermont Psychiatric Hospital. Uh, we have places for homeless like Harbor Place and the campground in Burlington that's been in the paper. And we continue to look at other regional options across the state. Let's go to the last slide if I can. Um, we will need people especially those in the medical profession to help staff these facilities. Now, in many cases, the, the, the hospitals that are associated with some of these facilities will be able to staff some and they're working on the staffing aspects of that now, but we need people to staff some of these facilities. The National Guard, for example, is staffing the, um, uh, the facility at the Essex Fairground. The governor has issued a call for volunteers and the response has been encouraging, but we need more, uh, frankly. Uh, we, need, uh, we need volunteers and you can see, you know, uh, we have uh, called out to nursing schools and staff. Um, we've, we've, we've put a call out to everyone that the governor has put a call out uh, and issued the response that we need. Um, you know, it's, the, the, the facilities are one thing, the, the uh, finding the personnel are another, and we need to make a concerted effort over the next uh, few days to find personnel 
to staff the facilities that we're, uh, we're, we're putting into place. Um, again, uh, if you, uh, if you have, if you need the website addresses up here, if you wish to volunteer, please uh, visit the website and sign up to volunteer. And like I said, there's been great response so far to the number of Vermonters that have responded, but we need more. Um, I, I just want to sort of start winding down this presentation by saying, you know, these are unprecedented, unprecedented times. And I know there's a lot of anxiety out there as we all try to combat something, frankly, we've never encountered before in our lifetime. Um, with that said, I, I do want to ensure Vermonters were attempting to deliver healthcare in the most compassionate method possible. It may be different, and I, I want to I want to make sure that people understand it may be different. In fact, it probably will be different um, than we're used to. But it's designed to be there in an attempt to meet your needs. Um, I also want to introduce, because I haven't had the opportunity to introduce uh, uh, Interim Deputy Secretary of AHS, Carrie Sleeper, who has been absolutely inter instrumental in coordinating the activities in this presentation. And we are here to uh, answer any questions that you may have. But before I do that, I, I, on a personal note, you know, I've had the opportunity to lead an agency with incredible people. I've had the opportunity to work for a great governor and, and his leadership. I've had the opportunity to work with other partners in state government, like Michael and others that have been just great. And the other Michael, Michael Sterling, who you'll hear, hear from in a minute, that have just been wonderful to work out, work with. But most importantly, I've had the opportunity to sort of meet Vermonters out there that are just doing incredible things. And I guess you can say I've never been so prouder. So Michael Shirley. He's muted, Ethan. He shouldn't be. I had a... Ah. There you go. That was a long pause uh, for me to stay. Um, I'm happy to add a couple fragments if it's helpful, but uh, it may just make sense. Uh, so much of it's been covered to, to pivot to, uh, to questions at this point. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Sorry about the, the mute issue. Um, all right, everyone, uh, we have uh, a number of folks on the phone. Um, as I mentioned in the email, um, I'm going to uh, un unmute people one by one um, for the, the question and answer. Um, please direct your question to the, uh, the presenter who you'd like to, to answer it. And um, there's some other folks on the line who might be able to jump in. Um, just want to add that uh, Commissioner Levine is also um, on this call if there's uh, any sort of health related um, kind of um, follow ups that you might be looking for. Um, so with that, I'm going to start with uh, Greg at the County Courier. Greg, you are unmuted. Uh, thanks, Ethan. Um, I guess I'm going to hold off on questions for a little while. I got here a little bit late, so I'll see what everyone else has to ask and I, I may ask something towards the end. Okay. Uh, is uh, Stuart Ledbetter on? Anyone from Channel 5? Here, I'm going to unmute all. Uh, Stuart, uh, are you there? Uh, hi, Stu isn't here, but Ross Ketchke is here from Channel 5. Okay, Ross. Uh, so a, a question I had was uh, from Mike Smith about the surge beds, uh, just because it, uh, the audio broke off on my end a little bit, and I just wanted to make sure that we were clear. So those 900 additional beds, 
uh, between all those facilities, plus the other ones from the trailers. Right now, the plan is to not use those uh, for COVID-19 patients, but that would essentially be taking over other hospital services, correct? I, I understand that correctly? That's, that's right. The, the, the plan would be to use those extra facilities, particularly the surge site in Essex Junction, uh, to take non-COVID-19 patients and have uh, sort of the, the care needed um, with the COVID-19 patients that need hospitalization in the various uh, hospitals that we have throughout the state. Now, now there is a just, I just want to clarify, UVM Patrick Gymnasium is a regional um, site being used by UVM for, um, for um, capacity, to add capacity. There may be some COVID-19 into that facility. Understood. Okay, thank you very much. That, that, that was uh, good to clarify. Um, Ross, are you all set? Uh, yeah, I should be. If I have like a follow up or anything, I'll chime in the chat, but I think I'm all set. So thank all you. Right. Thanks. Uh, next up is Sean Cunningham from the Chester Telegraph. Sean, um, you should be unmuted. Yeah, thanks. Just a couple of logistical questions uh, for uh, Secretary Smith. I'm wondering um, how many uh, beds are the two portable hospitals able to handle? And the second question is, do the surge trailers need a building? Is there a tent? Is there, how is that rolled out? Carrie, do you want to um, do, oh, Carrie's muted there. Um, can you unmute him? Yep. Um, Carrie, do you want to give the uh, specifics? Uh, the, the surge trailers are 50 bed capacity. Um, the portable hospital units, I just don't have that information right at this point. Yeah, the two portable hospital units are uh, only uh, 20 beds each. The surge trailers are 50 beds each, uh, but it, they, they do not come with staffing. And I may be able to add uh, some of the, the, the back end logistics of if we need to use those surge trailers. Uh, a map has been developed, an interactive GIS map that will then pull in the volunteer information and the medical health corps information and we'll be able to match based on the needs as a surge occurs uh, who's available in a particular area what physical assets are available in that area and be able to deploy them as sort of a, a rapid response force sean is uh do you have any follow-ups Uh, okay, hearing none. Um, next up is uh, Tim McQuisden from uh, Vermont Business Magazine. Can you hear me, Ethan? I can, yes. <clears throat> yeah, I've lost the, uh, the video here, but my question was for Dr. Levine. And I'm wondering, given the, the deadly nature of this virus, are we going to have to see a lockdown on nursing homes and similar facilities until there's a vaccine in another year or a year and a half or so. I guess what, what you mean by lockdown is challenging to me. Well, well, similar, similar to what we're doing right now, Dr. Levine. Yeah, so they're having <clears throat> severe restrictions on visitation. Um, um, and I think that works well. They're having staffing policies that involve temperature checks and symptom reporting okay. so that anyone who's working there would not work when they are ill. The thing that um, I think is missing in the equation, which would be very challenging, is nursing homes um, often have rehabilitation portions to their facility. Not everyone in a nursing home is living there the rest of their days. Um, and so they have an admission and discharge policy in process. And indeed, like any other business, they fill beds through admissions. And at times, if people are there for short-term rehabilitation stays, they discharge patients to other settings like uh, independent living situations. We're learning in just the few outbreaks that we've seen to date that often the virus accompanies an admission. 
so that that person is asymptomatic, but then three, five, eight days later becomes symptomatic, gets a test, and is diagnosed as positive. And of course, as we know now, has the ability to infect a number of others in the days leading up to their symptoms. So the lockdown would have to include this basically leaving everyone who lives there now there and not allowing anyone new in and not even discharging anyone to another facility. I think that would be fraught with substantial challenge. But the answer to your question is, of course, it could be done. Uh, if, if it was regarded as a dire strait situation that warranted that severe uh, an, an intervention. Well, thinking about people being able to visit their, um, you know, their loved ones uh, subsequent to the, uh, you know, in best case scenario modeling, would it still be dangerous um, to have people sort of having, you know, previous to this outbreak? having people visiting, coming and going. So one piece of modeling that you actually haven't seen, because it's not on any of the graphs, uh, but it's in the scientific literature, is what happens after you've reached your peak and then you've entered what's termed a deceleration phase in the epidemic. And during that time period, you may have very little disease activity in the community. Uh, maybe a very small baseline of activity that's you know, a very small percent. So that can last, you know, at worst case, a month, at intermediate case, three months, at best case, maybe six months. But everyone agrees that there would be what's termed a rebound after that point, and there would be a smaller peak of disease activity, but it would be real measurable disease activity and that the population to some extent would experience, it will just be less intense than the original one you were trying to prevent that we've been talking about in this call today. So no one knows what that interval will be between this first, if you will, onslaught of COVID-19 infection and whatever lies ahead after a quiescent period. So one would hope that during that quiescent period, most of society and our economy and everything else could return to a more normal state than they're in right now. But there would again be that later on disease activity that we would probably have to implement many similar strategies uh, in to prevent. Um, but hopefully that would be done on a faster timeline and on a shorter timeline so that we wouldn't be in for this more uh, unanticipated and prolonged kind of siege that people view that we've entered here now. So I hope I've been clear. It's, uh, it's like any modeling. Um, again, a lot of um, projecting and potential, but there is some science behind knowing that this virus that the human race hasn't really had to fight off before will be with us. And even when we think it's uh, quieted down, it will uh, act up again uh, at intervals. Um, so stay tuned. Thank you. Uh, all right, really quickly, we're gonna jump back to Sean Cunningham who did have a uh, follow-up, Sean. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the questions that I had before had to do with trailers and how those beds would be used. Do those go to buildings and what kind of buildings would be required? Or are they standalone with a tent or some other sort of structure? So, sorry, Sean, I uh, probably wasn't clear. It, it depends on the, the nature of where they're needed. So those are sort of the flex uh, force behind uh, the, uh, the surge sites that are being step, uh, step, stood up now. Um, so we've got a variety of different ways in which they can be deployed, and that'll be based on what the, the healthcare system in the area uh, prescribes at a given time. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Sean. Um, Kat with WCAX. Hi. So we've heard a lot of modeling about the course of virus and how it could play out in Vermont. And we've heard a lot about case numbers and hospital load. I didn't hear anything today about projections about when let's say businesses could reopen or when people could start easing back on those, you know, stay at home restrictions. But I think those are the big questions people want to know right now. What sort of time frame can you put on this right now? 
Well, I'll, I'll start. I don't think we want to put a time frame on this until we start seeing whether the modeling is, is, um, is going the way that we thought. As uh, Commissioner Pichek talked about, we expect the peak to be in the uh, mid-April to uh, first of May area. So we have the, all our models indicate that we'll have a peak uh, coming up here. As it, you know, we'll start adjusting our, our our sort of time frame based upon what we're seeing on the ground. We're not we're not going to ease up if it, if it isn't um, if there are you know indications that we we need to keep the restrictions on. At the same time, believe me, uh, as soon as we start seeing um, some as soon as we're confident that we can um, start releasing some of these restrictions, we will. But I can't, I can't put a time frame on that right now. We know the peak as we, we've got a pretty good handle on when the peak is going to be. What happens thereafter will, you know, as you further go out, uh, the modeling becomes less predictive. We'll, we'll find out what's going on. I think it's just, it's interesting when you go out and talk with people, what people really do want to know is, okay, I can, I can do this, but for how long am I going to need to do this? And I, I think it gets a little harder to tell people to continue doing it when they don't know for how long. Yeah, I understand. I wish I could put a date on it. I wish I could say, you know, X amount, we're done. But I, I can't do that right now. Matter of fact, it would be irresponsible of me to do that right now. Uh, I think all right. on my question. Okay. But, but, but certainly the decision will most likely, as the governor has repeatedly said, be science-based and data-driven. And so we will have our own curve uh, as we get into May, and we'll be able to see exactly what that curve looks like in terms of cumulative number of infections and the rate of new infections occurring, uh, and hopefully the lessening of the presence of the virus in the population. So. Um, we have to ask for patience, but at the same time, there will be data to inform that decision. All set, Kat? Yep, thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, Rick Jurgens from the news. Yeah, um, uh, speaking of data, I have, some, I have a couple of questions about testing. Um, I think right now, Vermont's about 700 per 100,000 uh, people in the population. And that's a little bit um, uh, uh, behind Massachusetts, substantially ahead of New Hampshire. My question is, uh, what level do you, of testing do you need to get to to be able to uh, look to, I guess that's more of a leading indicator of how, how of the presence of the disease in the population, whereas right now you're working from these lagging indicators, you know, hospital admissions, deaths, stuff. And so that that's my main question. My follow-up question is, is how far down the road is antibody testing that could start to identify people in the population who are ready to move on to another phase? Yeah, so the first question, actually, I'm not sure where your uh, source is for the number uh, that you found, but earlier today with my EPI team, we actually had a discussion and by some of the data that they were reviewing, we ranked in the top 10, <clears throat> top 10 states with regards to uh, mm -hmm. how much testing has occurred on our population, mm -hmm. um, which was nice, gratifying news, um, mm -hmm. to say the least. Um, but as you know, all week, since the end of last week, I've been advocating for um, as much testing as possible in symptomatic individuals. Mm -hmm. and. Um, We've seen a nice response to that, although I think it could be even more exuberant, to be honest. Um, so it's a little hard to answer that completely. The second question, um, could you repeat that again, just so I have it? How far off is prospect of antibody tests? Yeah, so I've looked at a lot of the current assays that are being uh, marketed. Most of them are being marketed without FDA approval yet. Mm -hmm. um, and they have a great specificity, meaning that most positives will be true positives mm -hmm. and not false positives. Mm -hmm. But their sensitivity is sometimes in the mid 80s, sometimes 90%, which would mean you know, 10, 15% false, 
false negative or false reassurance rate uh, from those tests. So it depends what you use the test for. If you're using an antibody test just to sort of screen the population and see how many people have had contact with the virus, whether they were symptomatic or not, that's not bad, although we'd like it to be even more accurate than that. If you're using it to diagnose new cases, that would be really not acceptable. And we'd continue to use the, the testing not on blood, but the testing on the nasal secretions and throat, et cetera. The caution here, and that's why I want to be very cautionary, is if we show that 90% or whatever percent of the Vermont population has had contact with the virus, that doesn't necessarily reassure that percent that they're never going to get sick again with the virus. Because what we know about coronavirus infections in humans, with the coronaviruses that have traditionally infected humans, not this novel one, is that one infection does not mean you'll never get it again the rest of your life. People get repeated infections with these same coronaviruses, none of which, of course, are as serious as the current coronavirus we're dealing with. But if this coronavirus is like the others, it, it would be falsely reassuring to an individual to know that they have antibodies thinking they're out of the woods for the rest of their life, like they might be with a measles vaccine or a smallpox vaccine, because that may not be true. Thanks, Dr. Levine. Um, Andrew McGregor from uh, the Caledonia Record. You are unmuted. Yes, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so far, it seems Vermont's number of deaths has been disproportionately high in comparison to the total number of identified cases. Are you modeling uh, and have any projections for the deaths? And if so, can you share those? So we have been uh, modeling uh, hospital resources. I think that's the critical element in this is that we wanna make sure that people who need um, a hospital bed or an ICU facility or a ventilator are able to get it at the time that they need it. Um, someone who is in the ICU who needs a ventilator who is gonna unfortunately pass away uh, will likely need those resources longer than someone who's gonna recover. So they're built into the model, but we are not projecting um, a mortality rate for Vermont. There has been a lot of discussion about mortality rate nationally. We haven't looked into the specific data sets that they're using. For us, it's more important to really focus on the hospital resource question. Okay, uh, and then I had one uh, sort of tangential uh, question in terms of um, the demographics of the hospitalized population. Um, some recent headlines have suggested that uh, coming out of Spain, France, and New York, that um, hospitalized cases are finding younger people and people with pre -existing health, uh, without pre-existing health conditions at a greater rate than anticipated. Do you have um, any impression on, on whether Vermont's cases so far are following that trend line? So in our modeling, we have used uh, data points from China, from the European Union, from Italy specifically. More information is being gathered about the specifics in the United States, because the United States has seen some of what you're talking about as well. Um, to date, um, without giving any specifics, I'll just say that the, peop the age of the folks that are being hospitalized and the folks that are unfortunately passing away are consistent with earlier data that we've seen um, in terms of the need for older people to have hospitalization, those over 60 are more susceptible to serious conditions, those over 70 even more so. So the numbers in Vermont seem to be holding to that trend, although uh, we are, of course, keeping a close eye on that question. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, all right, next, Peter Hirschfeld. Um, I have two questions. First is for Mike Smith. Uh, Mike, you talked about the Sturge sites that are being set up around the state, but what if anything can you do to address or increase the number of ICU beds that are going to be available? You know, that's a good question, Peter. What we're looking at now and what you don't see in there is the surge capacity of the various hospitals um, that we're working with right now to surge that ICU component within those various hospitals, unload what we, uh, that's, that's not a great term, um, transfer patients to the 
other sites that we um, were setting up, but also build the capacity of the ICU units within uh, the surge capacity of the hospital. We've asked the hospitals to surge past their existing uh, numbers in both ICU and other areas. And we are, we'll, we're, we're planning to get there, I think, within the next few days in terms of having that capacity. Because we see the, the same line that you do, but again, we're planning past the line that, um, that that Michael, the predictive line that Michael talked about. And do you, do you have an estimate at this point of what the max ICU capacity could be under a best case scenario? Well, we have a total surge beds. Um, we have the predictive model that um, gives us that we have gone, that we will per, go over the capacity of the existing capacity. That's in uh, one of the slides that uh, Michael had produced. Uh, so we don't have, uh, you know, we, we are basically putting up as many ICU units as possible right now. Um, and Mike Pichak, uh, is the modeling based on confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Vermont or actual cases of COVID-19 in Vermont? So the three models that we're using are based on uh, confirmed cases uh, in Vermont. Uh, that's been the data set and the assumptions that are being used. Uh, widely at this point among um, modelers from data out of China, out of Italy, and the EU. Uh, there are some models that have moved away from that and have tried to determine the total population with COVID-19. Uh, but for us, uh, we're using um, these models that have now existed for about seven or eight to nine weeks that show the percent uh, of the population that's been confirmed. The, the area where that will break down is if you don't have widespread testing. You know, if you don't have widespread testing, that's not a very good indicator. Um, as we've shown in the slide, and as Dr. Levine has mentioned, uh, we do have a good testing relative to other states, so we are confident in using that measure. Um, but we are also looking at actual hospitalizations. That is also a, a number that uh, it doesn't matter whether you've undercounted or counted the exact right number of individuals in the population with COVID-19. If they need hospitalization, they're gonna present at the hospital. So that is another number that we're going to incorporate as we get more uh, data, more cases. But at this point, we're using confirmed cases um, and we uh, feel confident in that. And then lastly, I apologize. Uh, the, the charts show projected number of hospital beds needed, projected number of ICU beds needed, projected number of ventilators needed. I didn't see any graph showing projected number of total COVID-19 positive cases. Do you have that? Is that something we can get? So the forecasting, you remember there was a multiple colored lines and there was a dark blue line. That was indicating um, where the total number of cases were going. Uh, basically, when we uh, take the number of new hospital beds, that's a percentage of the total new cases that we're going to see. So the current thinking is about 19% of your total cases are gonna require hospitalization. That 16 to 25% of those are gonna require ICU care and that about 54% of those are gonna need ventilator care. So basically we break down the numbers from there. That's where, that's where we get those specific hospital resource needs is based on those assumptions from other countries and what their experience has been. All right, so I can extrapolate from the number of hospitalized, number of cases that require hospitalization. Yes. It's gonna be 19% of the total number that you're anticipating. Right. Got it. And Peter, to answer your prior question about ICU beds, uh, additional capacity, those numbers have moved up over the last couple of weeks from roughly 130 statewide to over 170 total ICU beds statewide as the hospitals have added ICU capacity. Uh, anything else, Peter? No, but just to be clear, so the, the graph that indicates in the what you said earlier, Ethan, under counts the number of ICU beds that are indeed available right now? Because I'm looking at a graph that says there, there are 135 ICU beds available. And that's what the, re, the hospitals are reporting today. Um, as, as available today. Michael, I think that's in your graph, the, the, what the hospitals are reporting today. What isn't in that number yet 
is the surge capacity of those hospitals. We're still getting we're verification of that surge capacity of the ICU beds in, in, in that area. So what, what number should I use right now? How yeah. many ICU beds does the state have? Um, the number we're using right now, we're showing, is the number that's on that graph, Peter. Do you see it? I see it. I just heard uh, Commissioner Sherling say we're up to 170. That, that's correct. That's the additional bed capacity that would need to be staffed if they, uh, if they need to scale up additionally. Right now, the number of beds that are staffed and available for patients is the number that's on that sheet. Okay. So Sorry you had asked, about, yeah. you had asked about adding um, ICU beds. So that's what we were responding to. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, next up is Andrea from Seven Days. Hi there, yeah. Um, so I am wondering, um, of course, I'm sure you've seen all of the many models online that are kind of purporting to predict um, predict the surge in every state, um, and uh, you know that are putting those uh, those best case, worst case curves out there. Um, I know there are lots of pitfalls for predicting that for a small state uh, with small numbers, um, and I am wondering what your plans are for um, releasing updates to your modeling going forward um, as far as uh, what, what we can expect to be able to see and share with the public as we get closer to the search. So you, you are right, Andrea, that the smallness of Vermont and the uh, few number of reported cases early on certainly did uh, impact the confidence in our projections and in our modeling. However, the experience has been of other regions and cities and states that once they passed the 100 confirmed case threshold, uh, that there was more predictive power in the forecasts. So we have crossed that in Vermont. We've been over that threshold for about a week. Uh, we started to feel more comfortable um, with the trajectory that we're on. Um, we're happy to provide updates um, as that changes. As we talked about, likely to change quite frequently, uh, but on reasonable um, periods of time, we certainly are happy to provide those updates when the data has moved and the forecasting has changed significantly. Um, and, and is there, uh, you know, I see here in this, uh, uh, on this chart that there is actually a current ICU bed number, uh, an ICU number on the number of patients in the ICU. That's not a number that um, we've seen reported on a regular basis. Um, is that something we are going to see going forward? I, I guess that falls with me. Um, I, we can provide that number. We've been providing total um, hospitalization numbers. Let me just check on that to see um, how, how easily that can be uh, provided. I, I'm just not sure right now. Great, thank you. Okay, um, up next, Brittany from Local 22, Local 44. Yes, hi. Um, so my question is, um, you know, we keep hearing about the peak of all of this. I think about two weeks ago, I heard, oh, the peak will be in two weeks. And then last week, oh, it'll be in two weeks. It keeps getting pushed back and pushed back. And now you guys are saying um, the end of April, beginning of May. Can we rely on that peak or is it gonna get pushed back again and why does it keep getting pushed back? Yeah, I'll, let me just take that. I don't think we've ever put out a date unless I'm missing something here. No, it hasn't been a date, sorry. It was just people saying. Well, the people should be listening to us. Um, the, the one thing that I would say is that this is the first time that we've zeroed in on a, on a sort of a two week period out there we are you know given the data that we've gotten i'll let michael uh, commissioner Pichek talk about this if he wants but given the data that we've got we're, we're fairly confident now enough confidence to tell you within a two or two week range what we're what we're seeing in the data so you know other people may be talking about you know different dates but this is the first time right here that we started talking about dates 
I think that's right, uh, Secretary Smith. At, at um, you know, at, at the local level, I can't remember us talking about a, a peak uh, specifically local to here to Vermont. But to answer your question, Brittany, I mean, you know, if the peak does move to a um, later period of time, if it is mid-May, that would be indicative of the case of the growth rate continuing to slow. The slowness of the growth rate potentially could continue to push out the curve which would be a good thing in terms of buying us more time to get hospital resources, to get people the treatment that they need. I know you people want definitiveness and, and, uh, and specificity. We're trying to provide it as, to the greatest degree we can now, but if it does move, that again is indicative of a slowed growth rate, which would be good news for those that need medical care uh, from this condition. And I'll just uh, add something as well. Maybe Commissioner Pichek can add some additional detail to this, but as you uh, talk about peaks, there actually are potentially two. There's a peak community-wide infection, and then there's a tailing peak to hospitalization because of the length of illness and the, the way the illness develops. So it, it's also important to note that as you're talking about peaks, there's a couple of different potential peaks, and they're separated by a period of a couple of weeks. Uh, all right. Um, next up, Ann Galloway. Hi, thank you for taking my question. I have, I have two, actually. Um, I wondered if you could talk about how you're calculating the fatality rate based on the percentage of hospitalized patients. And secondly, I want, want to know um, how you're calculating the number of ventilators you need, considering each patient can use a ventilator for a number of days. Yeah, so Ann, thank you for your question. I'll answer your second one first. Um, when we're looking at the hospital resources and the need, we need to look at what Commissioner Sherling just mentioned about um, what is the delay in, uh, in the symptoms or the testing and the need for hospitalization. Sometimes there is a delay there of seven days. That's what our um, uh, outside experts are telling us, that that could be an average. So there's a delay in needing the hospitalization, and then someone could either present to the hospital and be moved to the ICU and then be moved to a ventilator, or they could present at the, at the hospital and need a ventilator more quickly than that. Uh, on the back end, people are, are going to either improve and move into a staff bed or out of the hospital, or unfortunately they might um, not survive. And then obviously those hospital resources are opened up for new patients. So what you have to take into account when you're determining the ventilation numbers is that we know that that 54 percent of individuals are going to that go into the ICU are going to need a ventilator so then you have to calculate what is the daily case expectation at a point in time and then assume how many of those folks are going to need hospitalization how many are going to need ICU treatment and then you get a calculation that can give you the ventilator treatment you have to take into account, though, that those are moving numbers, that there's going to be a delay potentially in people presenting to the hospital. And then those resources eventually will be freed up uh, because they will go home and be well. So those resources are sort of dynamic. They are available in week one. Uh, they're not available maybe for two weeks, and then they become available again in week three. So that gets calculated into the estimates about how many, um, how many resources we need at a given point in time. In terms of the, the mortality rate, we're not calculating actively a mortality rate. We're looking, uh, we are factoring it into the modeling in the sense that someone who does not unfortunately survive the disease will need ICU and ventilator treatment on average longer than someone who's gonna survive. So that gets factored in, uh, but we're not necessarily calculating a mortality, a total mortality rate. Why not? Well, what we really need to focus on is the hospital resources, making sure that people have the hospital resources when they need them. That's the critical thing in the forecasting. I think sometimes you want to look at, you know, what's the mortality rate um, because you want to drive home the seriousness of this disease. I think Vermonters have clearly gotten that message. They are abiding by all of the um, social distancing protocols we, that we can see. Uh, they're taking that seriously. One scorecard I saw had Vermont um, complying with the social distancing um, almost as well as any other state in the country. So I think that message is driven home to Vermonters. And at this point, we're using the forecasting and the modeling to make sure those resources are available uh, if and when they get sick. The reason I ask is because we seem to have a higher fatality rate 
um, than other states. And that's been shown in a number of different models. And it makes it seem as though there's an issue there that perhaps needs to be addressed. So certainly the unfortunate outbreak at, at, at Burlington Health and Rehab um, certainly contributed to some um, fatalities and, and early fatalities uh, here in Vermont. So um, we, I think the number of fatalities still is 16. Um, it's not uh, a big enough number at this point for us to really model out beyond you know, what we've done. Um, but certainly some of the early fatalities are, are tied to unfortunately those that were uh, elderly uh, coming down uh, with the disease. Uh, certainly um, something that Dr. Levine and his team are keeping a close eye on as it relates to other facilities, because certainly we don't want that replicated across the state. Do we have any ventilators at this point? I, Anne, could you repeat that? I didn't, I don't yeah, think- sorry. Do we have enough, uh, in, you know, in con the context of this conversation now, do we have enough ventilators? Uh, I can take that. Uh, the if we keep on the current projection, we'll be close. But right now, we're projecting there's the possibility that there we will outstrip our ventilator capacity. That's why we have 452 that have been ordered, uh, plus a FEMA request for ventilators. Uh, the first five arrived yesterday. There are five more expected to be lived, to, delivered today or tomorrow, and then uh, smaller cohorts of five in the first 25 arriving over the next few days. Another 25 have been shipped, and we're continuing to track the additional orders uh, that are inbound. So, so I'm, we'll I'm, I'm sorry to um, hog a little time here, but um, on the ventilators, thank you very much for explaining that. One of the things that's confusing is that in your model, you show the total number available at this time. And Michael's explained that we're going to need multiple ventilators in use over a few to three years period. It's really complicated. It sounds like you've ordered quite a few. So you're saying that you think you think we'll need that many, Michael? That we'll need 400 some odd ventilators? Or you know, no? As uh, as Secretary Smith indicated, we are preparing for the worst modeling that we have done. So the worst case scenario, we are buying uh, hundreds of ventilators and millions of pieces of personal protective equipment in case the models uh, go in a different direction than they're going now. Okay, thank you very much. And Thanks, if Sam. I could just add one quick answer here, tragic and distressing as the deaths are in Vermont, it should be noted, and we've been transparent about this, that 50% of the deaths that occurred actually did not utilize any of these surge resources we're talking about today. They remained in the place they were living at the time as part of a plan. Um, so uh, just to put it in perspective, because one could begin to wonder with such a death rate uh, if we need to be on the worst case scenario the whole time, but the reality is 50% of these deaths did not utilize any healthcare resources beyond where they were living at the time. Thanks, Dr. Levine. Um, next, uh, Alex Biasi. Um, yes, uh, I believe a question for Commissioner Pichak. Um, the mobility reduction slides uh, showed that dip on the, uh, the in the snowstorm in February, and I'm wondering how much, if at all, the case count uh, forecasts take warming weather into account and increase mobility. Yeah, so uh, good question. So certainly, um, I think what we're seeing more recently in that decreased mobility is, is really contributed, uh, I would say, completely uh, to the fact that uh, Vermonters are abiding by the restrictions that have been put in place around the emergency declaration around uh, the stay at home uh, order as well. Certainly, as the weather improves and gets nicer, people will um, be outside and taking walks and taking hikes. As Dr. Levine has said, those are things that are not to be discouraged, but to be in, encouraged as long as safe social distancing can be uh, adhered to. So we very well might see people um, being more active outside, but we don't intend, and we'll continue to monitor it, but we don't intend to see people, for example, re re regaining their commutes or regaining you know, their, their sort of their normal daily habits. Um, they might be out and about more hiking, 
walking, you know, being outside, but that does not mean that we will see uh, an increase in contact th that we're trying to avoid. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, next up, Hamilton Davis. Um, hi, thanks very much. I've got a, my first question is for either Mike Smith or Mike Pichak. I'm curious whether the state of Vermont has considered what I think in the trade they're now calling contact tracing. Yeah, I think that's the the would uh, the only way you can get from our quite uh, good track from the uh, all the uh, all the policies have been put in shape by this administration. But if you want to get to the best case scenario, I think you have to go to contact tracing. And my first question is, has the state of Vermont looked at that at all? And, the, and, and what I would also ask is, if you do that, I think that you're going to need a lot more tests. You're going to have, much, have almost unlimited testing, and you have to have a number of people do a new kind of thing which is almost literally to chase each case of the virus. The people that have done that are South Korea, and we, our, our track is good for the United States, but it can't touch South Korea. Mark, you wanna handle that? Thank you, Mike. Um, that is the entire intent of the expanded testing, the less restrictive testing we've been trying to use in the last uh, week or so. Um, <clears throat> The, the, the goal is test, isolate those who are positive, do abundant contact tracing, and enable those who may be at risk and may have, uh, are harboring the virus to quarantine themselves. Um, so build on the social distancing in a more extreme way so that synergistically, along with social distancing, this will help flatten that curve that we've been talking about. We actually have uh, integrated over 40 uh, law enforcement and public safety officials into our contact tracing uh, cadre of individuals and have uh, spent this week training them up so that they can uh, replicate some of the same kinds of interviews with Vermonters that our epidemiology staff do. So. Your idea is right on track as a country. Uh, nobody, including Vermont, could be as early as Korea did in, in that strategy. So it can't by itself be an exercise in containment that succeeds by itself. But we're trying on a parallel track to have that containment strategy that includes contact tracing go alongside with the mitigation strategy of social distancing. Uh, thank you very much. Can I have one more question? Um, I'm, I'm curious whether the, this I think is for Mike Pichak, uh, the, this whole question of models, there's at least a dozen models out there and different places are using different models and different models work differently where they're applied. For example, the model used by the University of Washington at Seattle doesn't, wouldn't work in, Wash, in Vermont at all. Would you be uh, would would your, your would you folks be willing to say what these models are and so that other people can mess around with them? So uh, I'll just that might be know, a take, bad idea. I don't. I'll know. take that. I'll take that at a high level. So the models that that we are using are not sort of these models that are available online. They're models that have been calibrated by these experts that I'm talking about. They're models that um, you know are used by hospitals across the country and by government officials and the like. So they're not um, necessarily widely available, but I will tell you that one of the one of the um, experts that we're working with from Columbia University, his modeling was featured prominently in the New York Times uh, about uh, I think two Fridays ago, where they showed forecasting across the entire country. So you know that's an example of the model uh, of a model that's similar to ours being used and deployed across the country. You know, generally what our models are doing. And the Oliver Wyman model, uh, for example, is, tra is tracking the actual outcome of other countries. So what has their actual outcome been? And then tracing back to those outcomes and then running scenarios against them and continually updating them to make sure that their projections are consistent with what has been actually experienced in China and Italy and other places. So, um, you know, they're similar to models that you can find online, but the ones that we're using are are uh, really um, not widely available um, online, like 
the ones that you know you see quite frequently floating around social media and the like. Thank you very much. Just one quick one. I'm curious whether Dr. Levine, uh, when he's talking about the likelihood of getting a, an individual who has this coronavirus getting it again, whether he has taken into account in that, in that judgment the relatively quite low mutability of this particular coronavirus compared to other coronaviruses. Great question. <clears throat> And all I can say to the answer is, the more that we're getting familiar with this virus, there actually is a mutability factor that comes into play. And the question is, um, is that gonna be an extensive thing or is that really not a major factor right now? I think we still need to, I think the jury's out on that. So I, I can't answer anything close to definitive now. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Uh, next up, Courtney Lambden, seven days. Hi there, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Um, so I have a question about uh, personal protective equipment. So does the state have enough uh, PPE to keep up with the number of projected cases? And do the models that you've presented today account for various PPE supply levels? I can take that one. Uh, the amounts on hand today have held steady and some have actually gone up over the last uh, week or so. So at the moment, there is plenty of PPE on hand. Again, we're planning for uh, the, the potential for um, an increase in the, the burn rate, uh, the usage rate and the number of cases that with luck will be well beyond what will actually happen. So we've got millions of units on order uh, the, as we indicated last week, the first uh, round of uh, FEMA delivery with several hundred thousand units arrived uh, just a couple of days ago and has been uh, placed into circulation and uh, supply chains are starting to shake loose a little bit. Um, so we've got inbound uh, PPE purchasing coming in, not at the level we would like, uh, but that's a really long way of saying uh, we're keeping up, we're ahead at the moment but we're trying to continue to scale up and get as much as possible in the event uh, that the numbers get worse than their current trend. So, sorry, just to follow up on that, does, does the model that you have presented assume a certain amount of PPE? Because presumably, if there isn't enough, then we would have more cases. You know, if, if healthcare workers don't have enough supply, that would change the model, presumably. It does. There, we have additional models of uh, uh, PPE uh, burn rate, current in, current uh, PPE on hand, uh, what's inbound, and models that have the same types of lines and graphs that you've seen uh, that relate to PPE usage. And um, at the moment, they look like they're going to hold, but we're not relying on uh, on that as a uh, a strategy. We're continuing to buy as much as possible. Is there a chance that you would release those, uh, the, the burn rates, the graphs that you're talking about for PPE? Uh, potentially, um, I, we're still trying to make sure that, uh, that they're, they're a few days behind uh, the confidence rate that we have in the data that's coming out today. So um, I guess I would couch it in as soon as we're confident that uh, they're projecting the right numbers. I don't think we have any problem with that. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks, Courtney. Uh, next up, Aaron Patanko from uh, VT Digger. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Can. Um, along with um, you know these, this model that you haven't published on PPE, do you have a model of um, how much staff will need in various scenarios? And um, are you planning to release that to the public at any point? We don't have a we don't have a model on how much staff we're going to need, but we do have a model in terms of uh, getting as much staff as we possibly can in, to, in order to do this. If you look at the predictive model, um, we're going to be, you know, like I said, there are two models that we're we're moving towards. We're planning for the um, the red line, the worst case scenario. 
we don't have enough staff right now. That's why the call out for staff that we're talking about right now. If you look at the predictive model, of which, we, which we're planning for the worst case, but if you look at the predictive model, um, we start, we're starting to look, if this holds, we're starting to look better in, in terms of staff uh, availability. Okay. Um, on a similar note, uh, how are you um, planning around staffing needs when in many cases in other um, places that are having a surge, many of those healthcare workers are getting sick and are kind of not available to, uh, to work? Aaron, this is a very, uh, this is an event that none of us have ever lived through before. And what we're going to have to do is call people up that are retired, that are nursing students, that are, that are normally what we wouldn't use, including EMS. If EMS isn't there, um, if we need EMS, we'll bring them into the facilities to use them into the facilities and have other people driving um, uh, ambulances as, as transports. Uh, you know, we got to, here's what I say every morning, we got to think differently about this entire event and the fact is that when we talk about it, we got to think differently on the different people and different so and different uh, skill sets that we're going to need in order to do this. I, I, I say this often: just because I watch watch Mash doesn't mean that I can perform surgery, but it may mean that I can drive a an ambulance if if I have to. And we've got to sort of match all those sort of things along the line. Like I, you know, there isn't a playbook for this guys. There, there just isn't. We're doing the best, um, in not only doing the best, I, 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 I gotta tell you, this has been an amazing amount of uh, resources that, uh, that the state government, private sector, in, including the hospitals, uh, the the uh, designated agencies that everybody has been putting forth during an unprecedented time. But if you're asking me where we're going to get the um, the personnel for these surge sites, I'm asking, please sign up. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I have one more question um, related to that uh, last one. Um, you said that this model is not current public. Well. Isn't it, you know, the widely accepted scientific community method to publish your methodology in detail and allow for peer review? Are there any plans to release more materials than are currently available besides this presentation? Well, Aaron, I can assure you that the professors that we're working with have, have um, been working with uh, ex external experts, even to their own universities, and have the uh, have their models and scientific thinking. Um, questioned and peer reviewed by them. Uh, the data and the underlying assumptions that are going into all of these models are also being peer reviewed as well. I mean, those assumptions are just as important as the models. We have no, um, you know, uh, reservation about making them public. It's just that the ones that we're using are the ones that, um, you know, we have, have trust in and, and they're individuals that we've established relationships with. So they can explain to us in great detail um, how they arrived at their model and how we should use it and the limitations of it. If we go online and use a model that is available, we can't necessarily have that same confidence level. We've also in, 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 intentionally worked with three different professionals to ensure that um, you know one model might not be very might be far off from another model. So again, by working with three different independent experts, we have confidence that they're reconciling with each other. Um, which gives us greater predictability. But um, we're happy to talk more about releasing more of the underlying assumptions, if, you know, if certainly if folks are interested in that. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, I think Greg from the County Courier has a question um, on a similar theme. Yeah, Mike. Um, I noticed the other day when the state started looking for volunteers, uh, veterinarians were on that list. Is the state looking to have veterinarians do patient care? We're looking at anybody right now, uh, Greg. I, I think that um, you know we'll we'll match up the the uh, uh, experience with um, with with what we need. But like I said before, um, 
we are in an unprecedented sort of time and we're looking at volunteers in order to um, they have some sort of medical experience and then we'll match them up. Uh, you know, I can't give you a specific answer what that matchup would be right now, but uh, certainly uh, veterinarians have um, extensive uh, medical experience in terms of where they've gone to school and what they've done. Mark probably would know more about it than I, but um, oftentimes uh, veterinarians will tell me they're, they're more qualified than the MDs, but that's, um, that is something that uh, we're looking at. We would take anybody that has some experience in the medical field at this point. Um, all right, next up, Michelle. Uh, oh, sorry, just a quick follow-up. Uh, oh, sorry, quick follow -up. Up. I, yeah, I thought, sorry. I, thought, I thought Mark Levine was going <laughs> to um, weigh in there and- Go, go um, ahead, Mark. And beat me over the head by saying that veterinarians <laughs> have more experience than MDs, but go ahead. No, I won't do that to you, Mike, but uh, at the same time, I think there's a theme here, and the theme, the governor stressed many times, innovation, creativity, resourcefulness. So if there's an important role for veterinarian, more power to them. Just like we're talking about how do you build a better ventilator? How do you take existing technology and turn it into a ventilator, whether it's from the automotive industry or some other industry? How do you create an N95 mask out of uh, materials that weren't originally destined to become N95 masks? That's what's happening in this entire epidemic across the spectrum of PPE and people. So we should think uh, creatively uh, as your question alluded to. So uh, just a, one quick follow-up. Has the health department uh, pulled the restriction that you have to be an EMT to drive an ambulance? I know currently you have to have uh, two patient care um, certified members on an ambulance. Can, can ambulances now run at least temporarily with one EMT and say a firefighter to drive? I'll have to get back to you with the answer to that, but thanks for spurring us on with a question like that. Because sure. when the push comes to shove, I think you do need to do things like that and think, uh, again, expansively. Well, I mean, it, it would certainly double your capacity of healthcare workers that, that could then rotate through uh, and, and do the patient care. Thank you. Thanks. All right, next up, Michelle Monroe. Hi, I just wanted to ask um, about the special population planning and to what extent that's including prisoners and if you could share what some of the plans are for addressing this outbreak should you get an outbreak in the prisons. Yeah, as you know, thank you, Michelle. As you know, we have um, done some extensive work uh, in limiting sort of access to our prisons both on the intake side and making sure there's a medical evaluation. And secondly, on the visitor side, making sure that we've limited it to video uh, visitation in terms of what's going on within our prisons. Um, we also have, um, as you may know, we have negative pressure rooms in uh, two of our prisons that we can uh, put patients during an outbreak um, in or inmates during an outbreak in. And lastly, we have testing equipment in all our prisons in order to, to do that. And then uh, on the employee side, we do take temperature tests on a, on a regular basis in terms of what's, what's going on in our prisons. The, um, we do have contingency plans for our prisons. Like I said, we have medical facilities within our prisons. We have negative pressure rooms in our prisons, but we also have been doing some surge capacity in the St. Johnsbury area um, in the work camp for those that don't need hospitalization in, in that area. That has, uh, we've released that information to the St. Johnsbury area. I think it was in the Caledonia record or someplace that I have seen that as a news report, but we are looking at surge, uh, surge planning using work facility in St. Burry for those that don't need hospitalization. And do you have um, plans in terms of segregating populations within the prisons? Are you looking at keeping people in separate showering or um, bathroom facilities? Are you planning on bringing meals to people in their cells rather than have them congregating in the cafeteria area? 
I'll have to get back to that, Michelle. I was talking to Jim Baker this morning, but I, I'm not sure on the movement. I know that the prison population is significantly lower than it has been in years, and there is more sort of social distancing going on, but I don't, let me get back to you, Michelle, on that. Thank you. Um, all right, thanks. Uh, Patricia from the Bennington Banner, are you on? Okay, um, I'm gonna move on to Austin Danforth. Hi everybody, I'm not sure who uh, is best suited to, to answer this, but whoever is, please feel free to speak up. Um, the first question I have was just about those search trailers and uh, where they came from. Um, Harry or Mike? Sure, the, the search trailers are part of the state's uh, normal medical surge uh, posture. There are eight of them located uh, around the state for a more typical medical surge, which would be a regional or local event. Uh, and the reason you're seeing a completely different posture is because the nature of this event just differs so dramatically uh, from what the underlying initial strategy looked like that uh, it's pivoted to a much uh, different posture. Okay, great. Uh, I appreciate that. And then second question uh, I had, had to do with other equipment that has been, I think, talked about recently and hasn't come up today. And that was uh, Governor Scott had alluded to uh, trying to acquire refrigerated trucks if things get really weird uh, down the road. Um, I, where where did the, does that order or procurement stand? The, the Emergency Operations Center, in conjunction with the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, have begun to deploy, and I want to really emphasize here, this is a just-in-case scenario. We do not want to be caught flat-footed. We do not anticipate needing refrigerated trailers, but there have been trailers deployed. I believe there are four of them. Uh, two are out. One is being deployed uh, tomorrow, and one is pending deployment in, uh, in central Vermont over the next couple of days. And uh, so, oh, sorry, sorry, Austin, I need to cut you off. Uh, the, the folks, especially the ones at AHS, I know have a, a four o'clock that they need to get to. We have one last question from uh, Patricia at the banner. Patricia. Hi, am I, am I here? You yeah. are there. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Sorry, I think there was a um, potential glitch on my end. I'll keep this short, I know you guys have to get going. I'm wondering, um, when you say, um, you know, you guys are planning for surge capacity, of course, it doesn't look like we're heading in the worst case scenario. But just to be very upfront about that, do you anticipate being able to meet all of the needs required in the worst case scenario? Do you anticipate that we, we would get to the point where we could meet those needs if worst case scenario were to happen? We're planning there. I don't think we're there yet, to be honest with you. I think we got some more planning to do, but um, we're planning for worst case scenario. With that said, I just want to I emphasize what uh, Commissioner Pichek had talked about in terms of where we're trending and where we're going, but we're planning for the worst case scenario. Um, as you can see, there's a lot that has gone on in terms of the various phases that we've done. We're in we're in a sort of phase one of a multiple phase sort of operation here and and surging up is going to be what our capacity is and you know in the upcoming uh, weeks depending on what the uh, surge models talk about but I just want to say you know there has you look at this there's uh, significant beds coming online with significant surge capacity that we we haven't even listed the surge capacity of the hospitals yet because we we have not uh, we're we're working on that as we as we speak. So the answer is this is an ongoing operation, and to get to the the level of the uh, the top of that uh, uh, peak is going to be ongoing and modular as we as we move forward. We're going to move it in modular phases, and you're seeing the first phase of a multi-phase approach here as we move forward. And I'm, so, I'm and sorry, I just, um, Commissioner. I want to add, hold on, just I just want to add, it is essential for Vermonters to take the executive order seriously, mm -hmm. to maintain social distance, to stay at home if they are not, not in an essential function, um, so that we do not run the risk of that worst case scenario. 
while we will make every effort to meet the demands that could occur if that worst case scenario happens, that is unknown whether we can meet that demand. And just before I let you go, I'm sorry, you guys, on the on the slide um, where it says medical surge facilities, just a very quick point of clarification, it lists the locations. How many of those locations or which of those locations are currently open versus which are in the process of um, being organized and put together? Well, we have set up the uh, surge capacities in terms of um, beds in the Berry uh, Civic Center, um, Collins, Mike, you, um, you correct me if I'm wrong, UVM Patrick Gymnasium and Collins, uh, Collins Perley in uh, St. Albans, but um, the Essex facility, Carrie, if I'm, is being set up as we speak or is on the verge of being set up, and the Rutland is on the verge of being set up as well, right? That, that is correct. One thing to stress, there is no current surge taking place. Mm -hmm. Existing hospital capacity is taking care of the patients at this point. Uh, the other sites, as Mike indicated, are being prepared, the large surge sites. So three of them, Barry Civic Center, Collins Perley, and UVM Patrick, those are currently in place, but they're not being used. And the other four listed here are not currently set up. That is correct. Okay, thank you. All right. Thanks, Patricia. All right. I need to let uh, uh, the folks from the administration um, get to, to other um, uh, obligations. So thank you, everyone. That was a lot of information to digest. I um, uh, feel like we spent a lot of time on this. Um, as Rebecca said around in the, in the chat, um, we're going to try to uh, keep you updated on a, on a weekly basis on this modeling. Um, so more to come. This is just the, the very beginning of, of the, uh, uh, an ongoing conversation. Um, so with that, I'm going to end the meeting. Um, if anybody has any follow-ups, feel free to email um, Rebecca and I or the cv19media at vermont.gov um, email handle, and we'll um, get everything sorted out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.